I'm blue. Dabba dee. Dabba die. Hello folks. This week I wanted to try something a little bit different. I sometimes find that when painting commissions for more prestige models, for centerpiece miniatures, you can sometimes get a little bit uptight around the sort of performance anxiety, I suppose. And I think this is something that really translates to when we paint our own armies as well. Not a week goes by where, in my sort of regular trawling of Facebook and Twitter, I don't see comments to the tune of, really want to attempt this figure from my army, but don't quite think I'm ready yet. Or something along the lines of, I'm going to buy myself this miniature to paint once I think I deserve it. And I want to maybe take some time today to show you that there are ways that you can simplify painting complex miniatures and approach them in such a manner that you're able to get a result that still looks beautiful, still looks impressive, and allows the sculpt to really be the thing that's on display here. Because after all, that is all the difference really is between these prestige miniatures and our rank and file troops in our armies. The prestige miniatures tend to just have much more complex sculpts or be much physically larger figures. And those are things that we can let work for us without actually necessarily having to do a ton of extra work. So I painted this Zinch Demon Prince recently for a commission with a slight conversion, just some wings from the uh, Age of Sigmar Flamespire Phoenix kit added to the back of it, and a bit of sculpting done to sort of blend them in using this kind of ragged leather shawl. Everything else is stock from the Demon Prince kit and required very minimal modification, and I thought it was a really good example of a miniature where I'm still painting quite simply, quite stripped back, but the net result that I get in the end allows that sculpt to really do its work, be big, be impressive, and be a centerpiece of the army. So let's go on a little journey about how I approached painting that. I will warn you in advance that I did use an airbrush for this one quite extensively, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't own an airbrush you can't replicate these techniques. If you look at my other videos for things like wet blending and faster blending techniques, you will see that there are other ways that we can approach getting blends in areas that we want them. But one of the big things is that I wanted to try and reduce the amount of time spent doing the major sort of big areas of colour in the miniature, and so an airbrush was the ideal tool for that in this situation. So let's get into it. Okay, so we're going to be kicking off proceedings here with, in this case, Vallejo Magic Blue. But, you know, essentially whatever your main mid-tone colour is for your workup is the first thing you're going to want to start to look at with the airbrush, of course, and just getting that applied kind of pretty much all over the miniature. I maybe leave a spot of my black undercoat here and there in some of the deepest, deepest recesses, but that really is just, you know, the, the very deepest creases. And from there, the colour that I'm grabbing is Reaper Spectral Glow. This is actually my top highlight colour. This is as bright as I want all my highlights to be. But I'm going to mix this into the airbrush with the remnants of the magic blue that was in there. And I'm going to use that to sort of start to get a kind of upper mid-tone transition built up. So, specifically on the wings, this is going to be very, very clear and obvious. It's going to be really easy to see where I'm applying this. But as we get to the body, I'm kind of just almost applying it zenithly. Very simple and straightforward. And then we're going to pure spectral glow and again just repeat that process only shrinking down the areas that we're that we're working on slightly especially with the wings again heading more towards the tips where the wings transition into that kind of flame sort of pattern and from there i can see that i've got something that's starting to really work but i want to introduce a little bit of visual interest so in this case i grabbed magenta fluorescent from viejo game color and I just started to kind of attack some shadow, not really shadow areas, but some of the deeper recessed areas, but not necessarily as a lighting thing, just filtering the color through. And because the spectral glow contains some greens, and obviously the main colors that we've got in the miniature are blue, this magenta just sort of produces some purples and some pinks and just creates some interesting little color changes that are nice for your eye to look at. Okay, now I'm going to grab some blue ink, some matte varnish, and some thinner, and I'm going to mix them all together in a pot, just checking the intensity on a bit of paper here. My mission now is to liberally apply that over everything that I've airbrushed. Now, something you're really going to want to watch out for here is that most thinners contain a surfactant, and that surfactant is most commonly 
some kind of soap or soap adjacent substance. What this means is that when you're liberally brushing them over large areas like this, you're going to get bubbles forming. So just make a point of finding those bubbliest areas, those areas where the bubbles are actually potentially causing you an issue, and just go in and sort of attack them with a wet brush to kind of pop the bubbles without really making all of this wash disappear. Then once that all over wash is dry, we can start hitting in some dry brush with spectral glow. Now obviously because we've already got this in our workup at this point and we've just filtered it down at the same time as we were kind of applying that shade wash, we've, we've sort of shaded and filtered at the same time here, modified all of the flat surfaces whilst accenting some of the darker spots. But what that means is that in a lot of areas we're only just a couple of tones lower than that spectral glow now. So as we dry brush it onto the entire miniature it just sort of ties everything together. You are going to want to make sure that you've got your good fluffiest dry brush for this and that you're really really minimal with the amount of paint on the brush, building it up slowly and carefully just so that you don't get any sudden fuzzy furriness appearing on the, the flatter areas of the demon itself. And then just a quick repeat process with some white dry brushing and in this case just you know being a little bit more selective with the areas that I dry brush onto. Okay so from there all of our prep work is done and as you can see we've actually managed to affect a massive amount of the miniature just in the sort of first few steps of prep work. This is the biggest single part of the miniature now done and that whole thing all together, all of those processes was less than an hour's work. So you can see how we've significantly reduced our working time here. But one of the next things I want to really focus on is starting to get all of that gold trim painted because this is one of the processes that in this particular miniature I have to do manually and is going to be a little bit time consuming. And you'll find this with a lot of these prestige miniatures, no matter how much you can shortcut one process, there will usually be one and often it needs to be done immediately afterwards that you just have to slow down a little bit for. And that's kind of okay because we've saved all of that extra time up front. So we've got a bit of extra time now to spend on things like gold trim. And it's probably a good time now as well just to block in the rest of the basic metallics. There's a few sort of silver pipes on this more 40k oriented demon prints. So we can get those all chucked in now. I can also now turn my attention to that leather shawl that I sculpted. This is again, it's, it's one of those parts in the process where we've got something that needs to be manually painted. But it is fairly simple and we can certainly attack it in a way that doesn't require too much effort. Leather and ragged textures, anything that's you know sort of damaged or worn or, or weathered, these are great opportunities to save time because there are very simple approaches we can take to them that will get a great result really quickly. And you can see here that as I start to texture these leather parts they come alive really quickly. They start to look fantastic with very very minimal effort. And once I've got all of that texture onto these leather parts you can see just how effective that was as an approach. And this was literally paint it flat in one colour, wash it and then give it a two stage highlight. It's the same kind of thing that we would do for a battle ready approach but because we're leaning heavily into texture and trying to create visual interest, lots of stippling, lots of dots and dashes, it's a lot faster to paint that way, but produces a brilliant effect. And of course, this is a quick opportunity where I can attach the shoulder pads, which I've been working up the same as everything else that I've already shown so far, just off camera. And one thing I did notice on my first sort of check over was that the, the spectral glow parts of the wings had they'd got a little bit too dark from the, uh, from the process of inking them down. So I decided to just reload the airbrush with some spectral glow and just come in and readdress the tips of those wings, just that brightest part of the sort of glowing spectral flame. And seeing as I had spectral glow in my airbrush, this also seemed like a great opportunity to do some uplighting for the base. So here I'm just doing exactly what you probably think I'm doing to be honest. I've got the airbrush at an upward angle from the bottom of the base and I'm spraying this bright colour upwards onto these sculpted rocks to make them look like they're glowing from underneath. You probably didn't even need me to explain that. And now I have an opportunity where I can actually get him based as well. So again, this allows me to take another step back now and say with the base, with the little bit of extra height that this base has given him, is this now creating an appropriate level of oomph to the overall miniature? Or do I need to come back in and maybe start to complicate things for myself a little bit more? So the next thing I'm going to do is move on to the head. And the head is made pretty simple actually by the fact that again, it was included in the other workups that we were doing with the airbrush. But because it was one of the sub-assemblies, I just wasn't showing it on camera at the time. 
But as you can see here, we haven't got a ton of work to do because we have got some good stuff already laid down. But I do want some really strong frontal highlights on this. I want to push some essentially pure white frontal highlights on this. Again, this is about drawing attention to the right places. We're inviting the viewer of this miniature to look at a small and highly detailed area which gives the impression of a large and highly detailed miniature, despite the fact that we're not going to spend hours and hours adding loads of detail to other areas. I also want to chuck in some nice textural highlighting on the horns here, because I think that makes sense. It ties it into some of the other stuff that's going on in the miniature. And then also complete the metal workups exactly the same as I did on the gold trim. So we're just grabbing the, uh, the same golds here, the same shadows, the same highlighting methods, etc. And that gets us to what I was happy to call a finished Demon Prince of Zinch. Now remember the philosophy that I've put into this miniature. The idea here was that I wanted to simplify the workload and still have something that looked impressive, that looked like a centerpiece, but that didn't require me to absolutely agonize over every detail and therefore have to kind of amp myself up to working on it. I wanted something that as I worked on it would feel pretty free, pretty easy, pretty relaxed, pretty enjoyable. And the idea here is to show you that when you get to painting these centerpieces for your armies, you don't need to feel apprehensive about that. Just simplify the workload and let the sculpt do the hard work. So you tell me, were we successful? Here's the reveal. Now, personally, I think this went really well. It is absolutely not the most devastatingly beautiful thing I've ever painted in my life, and I know that, but that wasn't the mission. The mission was to do something really cool and impressive and centerpiece looking without stressing myself out. And I think I've achieved that. I feel like this would be welcome as a centerpiece in an army. I can imagine it with a bunch of Thousand Suns rubric marines around it, maybe a couple of nice cool other Chaos Space Marine pieces, and this would be the thing that you would pick out with your eye. This would be the thing that would stand out. And I think that's really cool considering that all of the techniques that we used were pretty straightforward. Nothing was particularly challenging. So what do you think? Is sometimes stepping back and keeping things simple a good idea, or should we always be approaching our centerpiece miniatures with wanting to paint to the very best of our ability? Get at me in the comments and let me know what you think. If you liked the video, please do hit that thumbs up button and let me know that you liked it. And you can of course subscribe to the channel and you can enable notifications if you want to stay up to date on what I'm doing. You can find links to my social media and Patreon in the description. And the Patreon campaign starts from as little as $1 a month. So if you want to support the creation of the content, that's a really great way to do so. I'm going to get out of here for now, folks, but thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.